All right, my next guest is a New York Times columnist and MSNBC contributor. Please welcome our friend from back in the studio. Brett Stevens is at his home in New York City. How you doing, Brett? Good to see I, you there. Hail I am healthy. perfectly fine right here in New York. Good. Um, so you wrote about the city you live in, the city I lived in twice, the city I still love. I, I certainly have a lot of friends back there. My sister's back there. Um, feel for that city. The point of your column this week, though, was that the, the devastation of New York is atypical from the rest of the country, and the rest of the country uh, should therefore not have to play by the same rules. Is that about right? Yeah, that's exactly it. Uh, I mean, look at Westchester County, just north of the city. Uh, it's a commuter county. It has suffered more deaths um, than the entire state of Texas. Uh, Su uh, Nassau or Suffolk County on Long Island, they've suffered more deaths than the entire state of California. So obviously the, the combination of factors, but especially population density in New York City, uh, makes it just uh, a completely different situation from the rest of America. And so it means that New York has to be sort of thought of and treated differently than, say, the, the, the middle of the country. Or, uh, I mean, I'm in L.A. I, I read the, 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 in your column that uh, the death rate is 16 times in New York what it is in L.A. per 100,000 people, which I guess yeah. is because of density, right? And we don't ride subways and we're not in elevators as much. Well, I mean, that's it, it, the moment you stop to think about it, it's it's obvious, right? I don't I don't when I used to go to work, I didn't go to work in a car. I, I jammed into a subway with a hundred other people, or however many people per car, I jammed into elevators to get uh, to get to my office. So uh, all of that is just completely different from L.A. It's this, L.A. is the second largest city in uh, in the country, um, but it's it's just a very different story. And so it, if you're treating everyone in a kind of one size fits all uh, uh, approach, you're going to make some very large mistakes because. Um, it's simply a different type of um, uh, 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 situation um, from from the standpoint of um, the spread of disease in one part of the country than the other. To me, this this kind of seemed like a fairly obvious, not even a controversial point, but uh, not all of my readers felt the same way. No, I'm sure they didn't. There's, <laughs> there's a lot of groupthink, and I'm, I'm glad, you know, uh, Tom Friedman was writing about uh, Sweden, as many people are now, and I noticed at the end of the column, he felt the need to say, I'm writing about Sweden, uh, not because I'm saying it has the magic answer, but because I think we should debate all sides of this. I'm like, yeah, do we really have to say that now? But yes, we do. That's the atmosphere we're in, and we should debate all sides. So let's talk about Sweden. It's the hot new country uh, for how they're handling it, which is different. They let, they're, they're going for herd immunity, um, which at the end of the day, I think we're going to find out you have to have to defeat this thing anyway. Uh, I don't know if we have the time with the state of our economy to wait for vaccines and all the testing. It would be wonderful if we had a competent president and a brilliant electorate and the people were in great physical shape to begin with and, and the vaccine was right around the corner. We don't have any of that. Well, that's that's right. And the thinking was, well, you can sort of uh, stop the economy for, I don't know, two or three weeks, and suddenly a miracle is going to present itself in the, in the form of um, an effective therapy or a vaccine. And we can treat, and, and we could have treated this episode as kind of an extended sabbatical or vacation. But we, not, we might not get a, a vaccine, never mind in, in 18 months. It could be uh, many, many years. Uh, there is only so long you can ask people effectively not to breathe, not to go to work, not to draw um, a salary without creating a problem which is vastly larger uh, even than the d disease itself. And I'm not some kind of COVID uh, denier. I'm not a booster, as you well know, for the uh, um, administration. But we can't simply shut off our brains here. People say, well, Sweden has done much worse than its neighbors, Norway and Finland, which is true. It's also done about as, about the same as Ireland, which is all, which is in lockdown, and it's much been done much better than than France and Britain. So I'm glad the Swedes are providing us with um, a model of an alternative approach to to this problem. And at some point, we have to move from a strategy of trying to protect everyone, Bill, 
which I don't think is going to work. It might have bought us some time, but it's not going to work to looking at vulnerable populations, the elderly people who have um, uh, who are immunocompromised, have have other health issues and focus our efforts um, on them without um, without wrecking unbelievable damage on the country in the process. Right, because I, I wonder that if the, now we've sat home here for two months, uh, as most of the country has, and they say, well, it might come back in the fall, and it probably will, because by staying home, we haven't achieved that herd immunity. So what I, what I, to me, where the rubber reads the road now is, what do people say about this fall? If it comes back, do you lock down the economy again? I, I'd love to hear one politician say no. I'm sorry, but that we did it once, uh, and we may have already screwed the pooch on the economy with that one time. But we just can't do it again. We have to think of something else or try something else. We just have to. We have to be strong. Well, I think that's, you know, one reaction I have had to my column, which kind of staggers me, is people say, you're, you're putting the economy over people's lives. And that's that's just false. The economy means... Uh, food on the table for your family. The economy is essential for human health and well-being. We're not weighing lives versus the economy. We're weighing lives versus lives, one form of hardship against another. And the idea that we're going to repeat this exercise in uh, November and December as we move into flu season, if in fact this thing is, is seasonal, we're not, we're not really sure, uh, uh, yet, seems to me like um, a, a recipe for a catastrophe that will haunt us for a century. I mean, have, have people looked at 30 million jobless Americans, the figures that are coming in? It's staggering. And I think it should, should be frightening to people who care about public health as more than just a matter of COVID. Well, <laughs> I, excuse me if I'm repeating something you may have said a minute ago because you went out of out of the sound there for me because we are of course using ancient Sorry. or very modern. No, not your fault. You know, uh, again, I'm I'm not. Well, I'll just get to the point. Um, it was in the front page of your paper today. Um, Thirty percent GDP contraction is what they're looking for in the next quarter. They just got the results from this one, which isn't as bad as they said, but this one is a piece of cake, even though if you look at this one yeah. in normal times, you'd go, oh my God, we are, we are going into a horrible recession. This is the easy quarter. It's the next one. I mean, we're looking, as you said, about numbers. I, I don't get it. I think the world has gone mad if they think that everyone can be out of work at the same time. And... Yeah, we're, we weren't prepared for this to begin with. People don't have that kind of money, and they're not getting it from the government. And and look, you know, there's there's no end of blame to be assigned to uh, the Trump administration, to all kinds of people. But you actually you, that that aside, you have to sort of uh, think ahead and say um, if uh, not, if the Great Depression is what gave us uh, the rise of fascism and a certain chancellor in Germany. What is the next Great Depression going to do to our uh, to our politics? We were already moving in a uh, populist and uh, neo authoritarian direction when the economy was relatively good. Uh, what happens when uh, uh, you have tens of millions of people who are uh, out of work uh, and 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 desperate, not just economically but also uh, politically? So people have to start thinking about the balance of risk. Um, that's that's something no one likes to contemplate because they say, well, if you choose one, if you if you balance it in one way, people are going to suffer and people are going to die, and that is almost certainly true. But there are risks to uh, simply pretending that we can uh, hold our breath forever uh, and not and not hurt ourselves. Right now, this is a strategy out of the Vietnam War. We're trying to to destroy the village in order to save it, and I don't remember that ending very well. Right. I, I read a headline in, I think it was NBC News. It said, starving, angry, and cannibalistic, America's rats are getting desperate uh, <laughs> because there's less food uh, <laughs> everywhere. So, the, and I thought, oh my God, this is, this could be a harbinger, you know. Uh, people are going to get desperate and starving, and I hope not cannibalistic. But let me ask you one <laughs> final question about that, and I'll let you go. Um, so we used to argue about the environment 
And I never understood how somebody who I like so much and who wrote so many things and not being a liberal, and I'm mostly a liberal, I agreed with. But on the environment, I never could quite get you to where I wanted you to be. Has all this right, changed ahead. your opinion on that at all? Uh, on which part of the environment? I'm in favor. Well, that, that we better treat the environment way better than we have or else we're the ones who are going to die from it. Well, I actually, believe it or not, uh, maybe there's a giant failure of communication on my part. I've always believed that. I grew up in Mexico City where the environment is pretty, uh, pretty horrible and you see uh, the consequences of that. I think we got to treat Mother Nature with uh, a great deal of respect, but I think we're also learning that uh, productive, healthy uh, economies and robust scientific establishments um, are also um, a big part of uh, helping ourselves coexist well with, uh, with the environment. So look, I think this is going to scramble our politics in a lot of ways. And one thing that I, I, I should say, and I think any uh, honest person should say, is that if we all emerge from this situation with the same convictions that we've had before, it means we're just not thinking. Uh, and so this has prompted uh, new thinking on my part. I'm sure it has on yours. Uh, right. But uh, we, we need to maybe move out of all of our respective ideological boxes because what just happened was 1929. Things have changed. Uh, and if your thinking doesn't uh, uh, adapt, uh, you have, you have uh, problems of your own in addition to the problems of the world. Okay. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Not that you really had anywhere else to go. <laughs> Here you know, I am. Somewhere. Here I'll stay. <laughs> I know. It's so easy to get guests these days. Hey, are you available? Am I available? <laughs> of course, everyone's available. But you're always a great guest. I thank you. I'll see you in the studio soon, I hope. Thanks, Bill. Be well.